Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of St. Augustine's Confessions. It's a classic, and every philosophy and theologian should read it if they really want to get some deep introspection and really pick apart his brain and see what was he thinking about so long ago. So we were in book two, paragraph number four. It is certain, O Lord, that theft is punished by your law, the law that is written in men's hearts and cannot be erased however sinful they are. For no thief can bear that another thief should steal for him, even if he is rich and the other is driven to it by want. Now that's an interesting statement. A thief cannot bear that another thief should steal for him. Oh, from him, my bad. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because the thieves steal from others, but they don't. They themselves don't want no one to steal from them. Yet I was willing to steal, and still I did, although I was not compelled by any lack, unless it were the lack of sense of justice, or a distaste for what was right, and a greedy love of doing wrong. A greedy love. For doing wrong. That's a very interesting way of describing it. A love of doing wrong. So much so that people would describe you as having a greed element to yourself. So he admits to stealing. That's why it's sad. I wonder what he stole. For of what I stole, I already had plenty. Well, then that's stupid. <laughs> What does that make any sense? Maybe, let's see, what he, I wonder if he tells us. And much better at that. I had no wish to enjoy the things I coveted by stealing. But only to enjoy the theft itself and the sin. Oh, okay. So it was the thrill, apparently. He liked the adrenaline, the action, not necessarily the object. There was a pear tree near our vineyard, loaded with fruit that was attractive neither to look at nor to taste. Late one night, a band of ruffians, myself included, went off to shake down the fruit and carry it away, for we had continued our games out of doors until well after dark, as was our pernicious habit. So, kind of showing how hoodlums doing bad things after dark are really a cause of peer pressure to do bad things. We took away an enormous quantity of pears, not to eat them ourselves, but simply to throw them to the pigs. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you shouldn't took the pears, right? Some would say it's just fruit, but if it was your tree, you was planning to sell some pear pies or make some pear cider, get some pear sauce, something from it, you would be like, hey, where'd all my pears go? And to throw them to pigs, I mean, at least the pigs is gonna eat them, right? Perhaps we ate some of them, but our real pleasure consisted in doing something that was forbidden. The pleasure in doing something that was forbidden. That's a very unique thing in human psychology, isn't it? That he admitted to enjoying the theft itself and then enjoying doing something that was forbidden. So he didn't steal because he wanted to covet the object. Or that he really needed the food to eat. But it was the action itself of not being allowed that gave him the thrill. Look into my heart, O oh God, the same heart on which you took pity when it was in the depths of the abyss. Let my heart now tell you what prompted me to do wrong for no purpose. To do wrong for no purpose. And why it was only my own love of mischief. My own love of mischief that made me do it. So notice something that was forbidden only to enjoy the theft itself love of mischief. He said three things that tie to each other that really let us know his state of mind. The evil in me was foul but I loved it. Now that's a very interesting confession right there. To love the foulness within oneself to love the sin, a greedy love of doing wrong, 
I love my own perdition and my own faults. Love my own faults. Now that's a very unique one. I think that's quite common today. Not the things for which I committed wrong, but the wrong itself. My soul was vicious and broke away from your safe keeping to seek its own destruction. Looking for no profit in disgrace, but only for disgrace itself. That's a very interesting line there. Own destruction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that when we go astray, we only harm our own selves. So Aquinas, I mean not Aquinas, <laughs> St. Augustine here points out astutely that he only brought on his own destruction. I found this quite interesting, looking for no profit in disgrace, but only for disgrace itself. So he admitted, so no profit in the disgrace, not coveting the thing he was stealing, doing it for the sake of the sin and because it was forbidden, and then doing it for the sake of disgrace itself. So he's gotten at the key aspect here that led him to commit such a terrible sin. At least he's admitting it. Some people won't admit it. But he seems to have really analyzed his actions quite substantially. We're now on paragraph 5. The eye is attracted by beautiful objects, by gold and silver and all such things. There is great pleasure to do in feeling something agreeable to the touch. I, that's interesting. Agreeable to the touch. What would be a... I like fur. Hmm. There's things that when you touch them, you're like, wow. That's quite interesting. And material things have various qualities to please each of the other senses. That's very true. There are material things. Each one of them gives some sort of satisfaction to the senses. Food to your tongue, beauty to your eyes, great sense for your nose, a very beautiful bird call to your ears. Again, it is gratifying to be held in esteem by other men and to have power of giving them orders and getting the mastery over them. That's true. That is quite true. Very gratifying to be held in esteem by others and having the authority over them and mastery over them. I think all of us could relate to that. This also the reason why revenge is sweet, but our ambition to obtain all these things must not lead us astray from you, O Lord nor must we depart from what your law allows. Now this is great interesting. We must not depart from what your law allows. So here, a Muslim would say, stay within the Quran and Sunnah, the framework of the Sharia. Here, St. Augustine is saying, stick with what the laws of Christianity allow. If he was alive to say today, to see drag queens in Catholic places, doing drag shows in front of kids and a rainbow flag being held up. I think he would be quite depressed because they've clearly disobeyed. Wow, liberal Christians clearly are not following what the laws allow in their religion. The life we live on earth has its own attractions as well because it has a certain beauty of its own in harmony with all the rest of this world's beauty. Friendship among men, too, is a delightful bond, uniting many souls in one. I mean, I, I can totally see that. If you have friendship, these things are quite wonderful. That's why I think the breaking of friendships is quite tragic, if they can't work out their problems. Think about a world with no friends. Everyone just at all, it's self-serving. All these things and their like can be occasions of sin because, good though they are, they are of the lowest order of good. And if we are too much tempted by them, we abandon those higher and better things. Your truth, your law, and you yourself. 
Notice this. The higher things, according to him, is the truth of God, the law of God, and God himself. O Lord our God, for these earthly things too can give joy, though not such joy as my God, who made them all, can give because honest men will rejoice in the Lord. Upright hearts will not boast in vain. Now, here he said, God who made them all. We as Muslims say, Allah, creator of all things, disposer of all affairs. So here, we get into another aspect of some of the similarities of phrasing that go on within his book and within Muslim nomenclature. It seems to be that he is saying you'll find more pleasure in the truth, in the law of God and God himself than you will with friendship and the gratifications of this world. I do like how he explains that there's different material items that exist in this realm that are meant to adore your senses. And I think we all have encountered every single one of those faculties. For me, visually, and with my taste buds, I'll look at sushi and be like, wow, I want to eat that. Sound would be the stillness of air when it's snowing and the powder snow is falling from the sky. And as I'm stepping on the snow, it makes that crunch sound or the sound of rain, the sound of a beautiful breeze within the leaves of trees, ocean waves crashing over and over the roar of the ocean. It just has this huge way of clearing out your brain. Even the sounds of dogs barking, I like to hear that. I don't like to hear people chewing their food too loud. But for the, t the touch though, it'd be fur, you know? Also the feeling of clay when you're trying to make a pottery creation. When your hands are wet and you have the wheel and you're sculpting it. The way the clay, the wet clay feels on your fingers as you're guiding it through. That's also a very cool feeling. Like the way when you pinch it and it folds on the wheel. And you, you it's, a, it's hard to explain if you've never done ceramics. But the clay, when it's at a certain texture, does feel soft to the touch. Some people like silk, leather, stuff like that. Glass even. You know, they want really just pristine glass. Depends on what is your fancy. Textures in and of itself on different objects are really interesting. Like, if you run your hands across a really old table that's filled with memories, and it's lasted for really long, that has a different vibe to it as well. But it is quite interesting. What do you think? He has a lot of cool things to think about. I really like this guy. He'd be cool to have a cup of coffee with. 